Hello, and welcome to episode five of the God Cells podcast. I'm Eric Marola. I've spent the last decade reporting on different disruptive scientific innovations within the world of medicine. Change is the only constant in this world, and when an innovation like fetal stem cell therapy is poised to change the face of medicine, I make it my job to be there and report on it. The God Cells is my fourth documentary in this journey, with a sequel currently in the making. You can check out this and my other documentaries at ericmarola.com. That's E-R-I-C-M-E-R-O-L-A.com. Today's podcast is with Ricardo from Florence, Italy, who did not know about my documentary before receiving fetal stem cell therapy at MCEL in Kiev, Ukraine. He found out about the God cells all on his own. I always like to learn more about each person I speak to, aside from just their experience at MCEL. Today was a treat for me, as Ricardo is also a big fan of blockchain, a disruptive new technology that can change the face of finance, as fetal stem cells can change the face of medicine. As always, if you watched The God Cells or heard this podcast and are interested in seeking this therapy or just want to ask me some questions about it, it is my favorite thing to talk about. Don't be shy. Email me at eric at ericmarola.com. That's E-R-I-C at E-R-I-C-M-E-R-O-L-A dot com. I hope you enjoy episode five of The God Cells podcast. Hello? Hi, Ricardo. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> How is uh, the weather today in Florence? Uh, Florence, the weather was uh, very hot today. Yeah? It was cloudy, but very hot. Yeah, more than about 34 centigrade. Okay. Yeah, my wife is European, so she understands the centigrade. I have to go to Google and translate it always. Yes, yes. It's a little bit difficult for us as well <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it was hot, so you understand when it's hot, it's very hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually a nice warm day in LA today as well. It's uh, sunny and maybe in the 80s, so Fahrenheit. <laughs> yes, so you, you can Google whatever that is in uh, centigrade. <laughs> yes, probably. <laughs> so um, yeah, obviously, we wanted uh, wanted to talk to you today for you know this ep- podcast episode. Uh, just sort of tell me about your experience. I mean, I'd like to just start by saying that you you know emailed me a picture of you with Dr. Irina, which is actually my doctor since I've been there, going there uh, four times now, four years in a row. And it was your second treatment, and you were saying that um, you had been dealing with fibromyalgia and some other issues. I would love to just hear what you know, just sort of the story about what you were dealing with, what the doctors had told you, how you found out about M-Cell, because it's unique because I didn't meet you until later. I meet a lot of people that see my movie first and then they go. And it's kind of fun that, you know, you didn't do that. You found out all on your own and then found out about me. So that's cool. All started about three years ago. And uh, suddenly I started to feel uh, really uncomfortable. I was feeling weaker and weaker. And uh, as I was a very good sportman and a, a good athlete in the past, uh, you know, each of us is knowing his body and I know my body. And something strange was, was happening, honestly. And uh, so I was starting to do some uh, blood analysis like uh, every people mostly is doing. Uh, and from the blood analysis, things uh, seem to be very normal. And uh, after a couple of months, I started to have uh, some uh, pain to my bowel. And so I went again to the doctor. They made other analysis and the bowel seems to be fine. But they said it was possible uh, the bowel that was under uh, irritation or something like that. So nothing serious. Meantime... I had some uh, uh, lymph node that was growing uh, about on my on my throat, and uh, I was really worried about that. So I went again to the doctors. They made some uh, uh, ultrasounds, and they discovered there was uh, one lymph node was uh, larger than normal, more than one centimeter. And so the, that began a very hard period of my life because they started to say, you should do a biopsy. We need to check well, what is there. And so I was feeling, uh, wow, very, very uncomfortable and also very worried. So I went under biopsy and uh, they 
luckily they didn't discover anything very serious. But in the couple of weeks I was waiting for the result, of course, it was, uh, wow, I said, what's, what's happening to my life? Because uh, there was the, the frayness that it could be a cancer or something like that. And also the doctor were very, very close. They didn't like to talk about this, but I was understanding from their faces and whatever, when I met them. I was understanding that probably they were thinking something serious was going on. But luckily, it was not this the case. So I was starting to do search because I like to research. I'm an inventor, so I love technologies. I like to Google around. And I was studying and learning and reading all about. And uh, some of my symptoms, I was very weak. And uh, I had some back pains. And I had the bowel with some issues. And so I, I was reading about fibromyalgia and I contacted immediately the best doctor we have in, in, in Florence about this. And uh, I, I decided to have a visit and uh, she, she she was talking to me a, a, a long, for a long time. And uh, she said, yeah, probably you are one of uh, the 2% of men that can have the fibromyalgia because it's something that is... Uh, happening very often to the woman, very seldom to men, but this can happen. And so she said that there is nothing to do very seriously because uh, there are no very good therapies in this, but you can feel good. It's not something very serious, but as you had also the irritable bowel, as you have some some inflammation sometimes that it, it's happening to your lymph node, so the situation must be under control because this could degenerate in something more serious. We don't know if this happens or not, probably not, but there is nothing to do except uh, if you want, you can take some antidepressant and say, no, why antidepressant? I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm not uh, <laughs> in that condition. You know, I said, why should I should sleep more or uh, it's not the case. And so I started to uh, to be very upset because I said, how is possible that there is no one, one something that can cure in, in a very smart way this kind of problem? And so I checked uh, on Google and I found that this is something that is happening to many, many, many people worldwide. And unfortunately, there is no a really a real good therapy or a therapy that is good for everyone. So I was lucky because I had no very serious pains, but I, I was feeling weak in the evening. So my life was changed. The, the quality of my life uh, dramatically changed and I didn't know how to solve so one day I was speaking with a friend about my situation and said, I heard there is something happening uh, in one uh, clinic uh, in Ukraine because I know that one Italian singer was going there and uh, they are doing special treatments. I don't remember the name, blah, 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 blah. Right. And so I started to, to do some search on Google as well. I, I started to type uh, Kiev, I started to type Ukraine, I started to type... Uh, stem cell and I discovered this clinic and I said wow it was just to read and I couldn't believe what I was uh, reading also because I have been reading about stem cell I was very uh, surprised about uh, what discovered on the site and I said wow I don't know if I have to believe or not all of this <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, I definitely would like to give it a try so I started to talk with someone here and you know, when you talk to some friends or family, except my wife, that is always very positive and is always pushing me to do things, they say yes, but you don't know. Maybe it can be dangerous, or you can talk. You, you should talk to doctors about this. And they say no. If I want to do something, I have to do. I don't want to, to ask doctors because I, I'm asking doctors about more than one year without any solution. So I don't care if it's nothing serious. I want to fix. And so in. A couple of weeks, I decided to fly there to Kiev. That's great. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so again, at this point, you had still not heard about my documentary. You're still doing... Yeah. Okay, no. great. Okay, great. Yes. When I wrote them an email, they told me to send some analysis. And after the analysis, they send, uh, They told me that uh, they had a very high success rate for this kind of problem, like chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, irritable bowel. They said that they were very confident that they could have very good benefits, almost 100%. Okay. And so 
that's why I decided to fly there in a couple of weeks. And that's great. So tell me, because I mean, obviously you were open minded and excited, but uh, tell me about the first experience, um, the sort of what you thought about it, and then of course tell me sort of the the best of your memory, the timeline after you got the therapy the first time, and the sort of the things that were you know that you noticed, you know. Sure, I, I was there last uh, July, I think it was the 7th or the 8th of July of two years ago. And so uh, I remember I went there the first day in the morning, they made a, a lot of analysis with ultrasounds, uh, the blood, uh, the uh, ECG with, with the heart, and they made all this kind of routine stuff. I was very afraid because I don't like doctors, but <laughs> they were very kind. I mean, I'm very quick very kind and very quick, you know. I had no the time to realize what they were doing probably. And uh, that was good. After that, I made the first day of treatment with the injection of Fetacin cell. Doctors came well covered, you know, and, and they gave me this infusion. And uh, that was the first day I went to the hotel. Then I was just trying to relax for a couple of hours, but I could not sleep. And then I had a walk. And the first night I didn't sleep. I was feeling uh, very energized, but very, what can I say, full of energy, but also a little bit anxious. Mm -hmm. As you know, I, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. The second day they made um, other injections on my stomach. And uh, then I had also the treatment, the massage. Uh, I had a hyperbaric uh, uh, chamber. I went under this treatment again, and in the afternoon I was again in the hotel. Then I started to go walking for a walk, and immediately I was feeling different. I was feeling much better. I was feeling like I was walking on the X. I don't know if you know this experience, but just like the <laughs> the, the legs were flying. I said, wow, wow. what's going on? They were very... Uh, not heavy at all. I was I was saying to my wife Luana, oh wow, I'm feeling great right now. I hope that I will sleep this night. Also because <laughs> the quality of my sleep was very bad in the last year. And I was sleeping more than seven hours. I said, it's unbelievable. I, I can't believe this is happening to me. And so I was very positive the third day again, all the morning with, uh, with other therapies. And then in the afternoon, I, I was saying hello to any of them. And they were very kind. What can I say that I met some unbelievable people there. They are very, uh, they let you feel good anyways. And I know they are taking care of people in a very good way. They, they smile, they, they let you feel like uh, if you are home and not in, inside a clinic. Right. This is something very positive for people. And then I went back and I, I remember we had a problem with the with the flight because there was a storm in Kiev, so we had to wait four hours in the airport, and uh, we lost the, the the flight. We took another flight late in the night, so we we started to fly from Kiev about nine. We arrived in Italy about two in the night, and. Uh, I was driving all the night because I fly to Rome and from Rome to Florence we had from the airport more than three hours driving and I arrived almost 5 at 30 in the morning and I was feeling like, wow, great. I was not tired at all and I couldn't believe what was going on. So for I had dramatic results almost immediately after two, three, four, five days. Then uh, I was feeling good, but the energy was a little decreasing after the first month. I was not uh, going uh, to the beach for three weeks. They suggested me to avoid direct sun for two, three weeks after the treatment. And then I had vacation in Sardinia, a beautiful island here in Italy. And that was the second month. And immediately after 60 days, wow, I, I, I went to the gym and I, I made a record. I, I was always running, you know, and doing other stuff. And my body was incredible, feeling great. And I said, well, I can't believe this is happening. Also, I lost completely some trembles that I had on my legs. Because during that year, something that was very scary for me is that sometimes, for any reason, I had some trembles on my legs some tremors so uh, it was 
very very scary very very bad very bad feeling and they disappeared completely so i i could not believe and everything was normal was the power no pain the the pain back disappeared the energy was good i was feeling positive i was sleeping better so my life went back again but this is exactly what happened two years ago that's amazing that is so awesome um yeah it's so interesting to hear different people's experience because like just the last time I was there, uh, a man named John, who uh, was my last podcast, had very similar, he had different reasons he was there, but very quick response. And while others, even a really a couple of good friends of mine, I mean, they did okay, but they didn't have, they had different reasons, of course, too. They didn't have the same quick response. It is so interesting how some people just respond really quickly and really, really well. And other people, it's slower and, you know, it's sort of unsure. So I guess I say that because it's, you know, people that are listening, it's not everybody, yeah. but when it works for people, it's so exciting, you know, it's like obviously yes. for you. And that was just your first treatment. Yes. <laughs> That's great. It was the, first, yeah. the first treatment, yeah. So and let me, then, uh, yeah. Oh, forgive me, I'm going to ask you because I, I have also been through this treatment, but I do it, you know, for more anti aging uh, reasons and longevity and preventative. Yes. But, I, but it doesn't mean that I don't experience sort of similar waves of improvement uh, of my life anyway. Was there any changes? Was there any diminishment over time? I, uh, tell me about why you went back a second time and sort of how all that... Yes. Yeah, so go ahead. Yes, uh, in the medical report, they were writing to me, they were suggesting to be back in 18 months or maximum two years because they explained it to me it should be better to have uh, other treatments. Mm -hmm. Of course, it depends from people to people and from the kind of problems. Very honestly, they said to me that I had nothing serious and most of people going there are going for much uh, severe issues. So I was lucky maybe to be there, not to have uh, something very serious. Mm -hmm. But you know, and uh, yes, I was experiencing the first year after the treatment, everything was great. Then after 18 months, I was feeling a little of declining of uh, the, um, I don't want to say the performance, but the feeling of my body. I was feeling sometimes that uh, I was a little more tired in the afternoon, in the evening. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was feeling like a little bit of less energy. And I was experiencing again that I was not sleeping as, as good as before. Mm -hmm. So as I had to fly back after 18, 24 months, I decided to, to go back and uh, we arrived at to one week ago when I was back in the clinic. Okay. <clears throat> Almost two years, yeah, a little bit less, and 23 months. It was July and I went back in June, so one month before. Okay. So it was fibromyalgia, some digestive abdominal issues. Uh, like irritable bowel, um, and you had some sleeping issues, and you had some pain as well, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Some pain, some weak pains, but you know, they say that you have fibromyalgia when they touch you in uh, uh, 12 points, and minimum you have soft or medium pain in 8 or 9 points of your body. So right. when I had the visit, they were touching me on the back, on the shoulder, on the stomach, in several uh, points, in trigger points. And in some of them, even with a very small pressure, I was feeling pain. Not, no strong pain, but it was like I was more sensible to the pain, you know. Sure. Each of us has a level to feel the pain and was more sensible than other people. That's why they say, yeah, we are confident because this kind of problem, the pain, uh, the bowel. And also I didn't tell you that when uh, I was there for going to Kiev, I discovered that I had a mononucleosis because when I had a lymph node uh, that was larger than normal, I made also some other blood tests and they discovered that the reason of the lymph was probably because I had a mononucleosis. That's another virus that... Uh, uh, destroys the immune defense and sometimes in the life the, the, the virus can be back, not harmful but so the, the, the immune defense can, can be hurted a little bit and the liver as well and so this is another thing that pushed me to, to fly to Kiev and it the took kiss, care of the, the, the kiss illness the right illness. yeah right right yeah. <laughs> so did this get rid of the money nucleosis as well then Yes, so okay. I, I, I had uh, probably in some years ago, we don't know when, because when you do the analysis, you discover, I discovered I had, but it was a, 
a recent period I had, but doctors told me that when you have, sometimes uh, you can, uh, it can come back with some issues, uh, putting down the, the immune system and so on. So when I went back uh, almost one, one week ago there in Kiev, I had uh, the doctors who are visiting me, the, Dr. Zirina and all the staff, uh, they were very happy because they found me in very good condition, much better than the first time I was there. Mm -hmm. and so they said, wow, it seems that you're fine. And so they, they went under the treatment, they made the blood analysis again and all the, all the analysis and probably they knew that the, the results almost immediately because as far as I know, when they give you the therapy, these fetal stem cells, they try to target depending from the results they have from the blood test and all the other uh, ultrasounds to the body so they try to target the best therapy that you that you should need depending from the analysis uh, they told me wow is it ricardo it's like that uh, the watch was stopping for you more than two years ago because you are much better than the first time you came here <laughs> <laughs> so that's I said, wow that's good Yes. No, they tell me the same things, honestly, and I can see it in myself. It's uh, it's remarkable. But um, yes. wow, that's so exciting. Um, so yeah, I mean, how does it feel overall just to have discovered this place? Um, and I don't know. I mean, because I don't like. In my opinion, one of the reasons I make these movies is when I discover, well, I start to investigate different technologies for my next movie. Um, you know, I just once I really dive in and understand what it is, um, I just get really excited and go, "My goodness!" I mean, I wish so many more people knew about it. You know, yeah. but um, but yeah, I guess sort of. It must, it's always interesting to understand what goes through people's mind when they they found this on their own. And then they have these wonderful results. And, um, you know, when mainstream medicine, unfortunately, while it has its, you know, it helps a lot of people, but it doesn't help everybody, you know? I'm just sort of curious to hear about how you feel about that. Yes, sure. Well, honestly, it was uh, an incredible feeling when I was there, also because uh, we should be. There are also some ethical issues about around all this stuff. You know, we, I live in Italy, for example. We have the Vatican, we have the Pope, we have the law that it's uh, now uh, abortion is allowed, but it's a controversial mm -hmm. situation. And uh, uh, I, I was feeling comfortable, and uh, I think that uh, it's, it's unbelievable that this clinic and this therapy is so now well known worldwide i mean because it's a pity that many 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 people could probably have some benefits at least they provided incredible benefits to me so i was experiencing these benefits i cannot i cannot say it's not true or, or whatsoever because i was uh, directly experiencing this right but when you talk with people sometimes or with people close to you it seems i don't want to say they don't believe you <laughs> uh, everything is they are very critical yeah. you know sometimes you feel that uh, uh, you want to share things you want to help others but many people are not ready or they are very close they are not so open-minded so no it is i know exactly how you feel because it does sound like science fiction to so many people um, and it's kind of fun to have you on and talk to you today because you are, which I'm going to sort of bridge into the next subject, because you are interested in technology. You're an inventor and you would be the first to realize that when really incredible innovations are introduced to humanity in the beginning, it always does seem like science fiction, you know, <laughs> especially yes. when you're talking about aborted fetuses and oh my God. And, and by the way, even though you're in Italy and you have the Vatican and, you know, sort of the birth of Catholicism in the United United States. I mean, just this week, you know, the Trump administration is no longer allowing government funding for fetal research. And like, it's used as a political tool all the time. But going back to the um, innovative technology, I mean, I'm sure 20 years ago, if you told people we would have video conferencing on our phones, they would look at you like you're crazy, you know, <laughs> like, you know, there's just it's a it's ubiquitous through our existence is is our our ability to innovate but when it comes to health of course you have the market forces that innovation is kind of an enemy because it's such a damper on the economy side of uh, medicine and then you combine that with the possibility that you it, there's a lot of scams out there and people it, 
take advantage of people that are desperate. And it happens all the time, especially in stem cells. All across the United States, there's a lot of shady stem cell clinics um, that aren't even really giving stem cells, but they put yeah. the name stem cell at the end, you know. So there are scams. I can tell you that yeah. <laughs> when I was waiting for the when I was waiting for the blood analysis, sorry, for the biopsy results, and uh, my brother was importing some special devices that are producing hydrogen in the water. We have a patented technology there in Korea about this. And uh, they produce something like alkaline water, but with full of uh, enriched hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And so there was a doctor coming from the United States that wrote a very big, very a book that was uh, read from many, many people. And so I said, well, I need to go to this conference. It's, it's interesting because it was interested also in Europe about this kind of devices. This, this doc, I don't want to say the, doc, the name of the doctor, of course. By the way, I went there, I spent $2,000 and uh, I had some, uh, he was visiting me, he was doing some something like uh, a dry blood test that has no scientific uh, meaning. And guess what he told me? He told me that probably I had a, can I had a cancer. <laughs> and so he told me I had to pay other $3,000 for a special analysis he was conducting with another woman close to him. Yeah. And the day after, I was speaking with some other people that were there, and they told me the same thing. So yeah. he was saying the same thing to people because he wanted to do other analysis. So I agree 100% with you that uh, unfortunately, uh, out there are many people that are suggesting fake therapies or something that it's, it has nothing to, to relate with this. But as I'm an inventor, when I went to Amcel, I was also reading some patents. They applied many, many patents. Mm -hmm. I applied patents. I have 21 patents in the United States as well. So I, I like to, to read patents and I understand when there is a patent, there is a technology behind. Maybe can be something we don't understand because it's new, it's out of my matter of expertise. But I realized there was a technology, and when there is a technology, that there is something behind. And that's why I said I want to go there, because there are some basic uh, of real science and real um, innovative medicines. And when we talk about stem cells, stem cells uh, fetal or mesenchymal or other kinds of uh, stem cells, it's a difficult matter. But everybody knows that this can be... The, the solution of many illness for the future. Right. And not to mention, I can't help but to always remind everybody that this was discovered because of what was observed during pregnancy. It wasn't just invented out of nowhere. Like any good scientific invention or innovation, it was discovered because of something else that was, you know, discovered accidentally or observed in another manner, you know? So like a simple example, like the hair loss medication Propecia, that was a prostate drug for years. And then suddenly yeah. they realized people were growing hair, you know, guys were growing hair that were had male pattern baldness yes. and oh boy, what's going on here. And then they pulled that out and now suddenly there's a new drug. It's, you know, that's an oversimplification, but it happens all the time. I, with these podcasts, I love to talk about um, you know, of course, the reason you went there, but I think it's fun to get to know each person. And I was interested to find out that you do some research or some kind of work in the blockchain space. And me being not just interested in medical innovations, but I'm also interested in anything. Ever since I was a kid, I was fascinated by how innovations affected society. Everything from something as simple as the bow and arrow to the gun, not that I'm a fan of guns, but or the horse and carriage to the car, you know, pre-internet, which I lived through, through the internet. I watched the long distance companies be destroyed when they thought that would never happen to them. Blockbuster video in America was destroyed by Netflix. Innovation is inevitable and it's going to make its way through. And I see blockchain as something that similar to fetal stem cells, it's so misunderstood Understood. And uh, I would love to hear your kind of talk on that, um, what your experience is with blockchain. Where, as an inventor, as someone that sort of studies new technologies, where do you see that taking us as a society? Yeah, uh, well, blockchain is very interesting because it's, uh, it's an innovative technology, very innovative technology, safe and sure. The problem is that many people are confusing uh, the blockchain and the cryptocurrency and the scam of some cryptocurrencies. So. 
uh, this is why blockchain is something misunderstood from people. But blockchain is uh, an incredible technology able to secure data, to share data with someone uh, that can be counterfeit. And so they have a lot of advantages uh, uh, talking about this technology. And of course, uh, apply the the coins or to system of payments, uh, they can fix a lot of issues uh, because you can send money in three seconds from the other part of the globe uh, with a very low fees yep. and no one can hack, uh, hack uh, your coins or your wallet so it's much more safer than any credit card or any kind of payments. can be anonymous because can be adopted from, from users without any kind of, uh, with very high secure of privacy as well. So I've been patenting a couple of technologies. One is very funny because I'm transforming kinetic energy from uh, mobile devices. So I was applying a patent in the United States and in Europe as well that I am converting the movements of kinetic energy to allocate uh, cryptocurrency. So the more you move, the more you're getting some rewards. Wow. And I'm applying another, applied another patent to, and I was also on uh, Fox Television for this. Uh, in a special uh, TV show, and uh, I had uh, I was there three times in the United States for this TV show because I was uh, finding a way to allow people to have a trusted uh, profile uh, using the blockchain. So any any of people, we have a problem, for example, on LinkedIn that they don't ask uh, about your identity. So LinkedIn is a big portal of business, mm -hmm. but you know, there are about 350 Donald Trump and there are about <laughs> 700 right. Mickey Mouse and uh, <laughs> Donald Duck as well. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> about 30% of people there are fake because I can say I have a Ferrari, I drive uh, airplanes, I'm manager of 10 companies and all this information are fakes. Mm -hmm. and for example, LinkedIn is is well known, it's a very good company, but they, they have this kind of problem. So I wanted to find a way to give the chance to people to be trusted and the blockchain can verify your identity, can verify if you're living somewhere, if you if you have a, a real phone number, if you have some uh, kind of school, if you attended one place or another one. So I was doing this and um, so I was speaking in New York for three times about this uh, this new technology coming. So any any anyone can can use this. Uh, you can create a badge. Budget means that you're rated, you are verified, and so you say I'm Eric, and uh, anyone in the world can be sure you're Eric. It's not a fake identity, and so blockchain is a big uh, life changing, and also in the medical field because uh, companies, hospitals, they could share. Uh, research and studies all yep. over the world without losing too much time you know sometimes people from australia how can they know if there is some effective treatment uh, in italy to cure cancer or to to fight any terrible disease that are uh, unfortunately present in the world so this can be something very important because the data can can't be modified right and this is a big advance for the humanity. And the same for cryptocurrency, because there is, there is a space there, very, very interesting also for people that have ideas, that wants to get funds in a smart way, in a legal way as well. So also in that field, it's very controversial because the United States, SEC, is putting a lot of stops at these in other countries as well. So there is a need of more regulation, but luckily in the last year, there are regulations, so laws that protect uh, from anti-laundering and uh, other kind of uh, dirty money. It's not true that it's anonymous. So it's not true. Blockchain is the future. Yeah. yeah no, it's it's a what's it's interesting. It's kind of similar to say the case of fetal stem cells. It's so misunderstood. With blockchain, the irony is because there are so many scammers who will say you know sell fake cryptocurrency to unsuspecting people that don't understand. Yeah 
understand what it is. So you have that. You have people with these pyramid schemes using cryptocurrency to rip off the public. There are genuine pyramid schemes, but the cryptocurrency itself is one of the most transparent inventions ever when it comes to the financial system. I mean, even today when hackers hack into an exchange and steal people's money, it's very difficult for those people to sell that cryptocurrency because you can see its movement across the blockchain and everybody gets together and, and blacklists those wallet addresses. So, I mean, talk about transparency. Imagine, you know, so anyway, I guess what I'm getting at is what's fun about the subject is you have governments and regulatory agencies claiming money laundering and lack of transparency when this is the most transparent form of finance we've ever invented. So, so anyway, it's kind of amusing um, because if cash is the most anonymous, I mean, you can carry cash or you can melt gold into nails and doorknobs, which is used all the time to pay for drugs. Yeah. But you try to pay for drugs on Bitcoin with Bitcoin or something like that. And when, you know, if they know who you are, they're going to follow you no matter where you go and follow your money. And so that being said, imagine if the government's budgets were on the blockchain, there would be no more, where did my money go? You know, there would be, um, there would yeah. be, also, yeah. Also about donation, for example, that yeah. we, we donate money, we don't know where they go. So yep. you can track every, de every step and you are absolutely right. Yeah. With the blockchain, you know, uh, you know, who is the address of the sender and who is the receiver, and you can also easily know the uh, the IP address of the sender and, and of the receiver. Right. The only thing you don't know is the name of the person, but very honestly, if you know the location, maybe it's sure. the family, but it's one I mean, of the family, yeah. so it's much more safe <laughs> than any other one. They, the, there is the difference with, between privacy, you know, and money laundering, or you say we cannot understand uh, who is the owner? No, that's that's not the truth. Yeah, it's like a game. It is. It is. It's a, but it's like anything with new technology is invented. All the confusion yeah. hits and the propaganda begins. Because what I like about it from a currency point of view is a few aspects. One is it's the first thing that's ever been invented that is in direct competition to the banking system. So people that are good at it, um, that understand how to s preserve their cryptocurrency, because you are in control of it, and if you somehow lose it, that, you know, that, that's, it's gone. But as we know, when we put our money into a bank account, that's sort of a big IOU. If you put a million dollars into a bank account one day, and then the next day you want to withdraw it all in cash, you're not going to be able to do that. It's going to take some time because they're busy loaning your money out to other people. So you have that. And, but if you have it in your control, you have control over it. And then, of course, I'm so fascinated by the limited supply. So with something as simple as Bitcoin, which started the whole blockchain phenomenon, um, you know, with 21 million of them, it's in a forever deflationary um, kind of characteristic, while the dollar and every other paper currency is in an inflationary mode. Like in Venezuela, with a hideous inflation, something like it started out 1 million percent, now it's 10 million percent. People that bought Bitcoin in Venezuela at $20,000 still had more money when Bitcoin went down to $3,000 <laughs> because of the inflation against their currency. So it is fascinating. Oh, it's, it's nice because you can plan uh, the numbers of the coin, the years, the deflection. I, I'm working on a project like that with a new revolutionary cryptocurrency with very special uh, very special technical specification about uh, the coin production uh, and how many years will be mined with a proof of stake instead of proof of instead of proof of work so right. to avoid the energy consumption. I mean, there is a world there very very interesting from this kind of point of view, and it's also nice because you can challenge with technologies, you can challenge with marketing. It's something great to yeah. Measure. Absolutely. And something as simple as the fact that we live in a world where we can send an email from uh, Los Angeles to China, it arrives in like nine seconds. But if you want to wire money, like I've, some of my distributors are in Europe and they'll wire money, say on a Monday, and then by Thursday or Friday, it's still not here. Oh no, it got tied up, it got kicked back. Oh, it can take two, three weeks to get a wire transfer. And yet, you know, cryptocurrency solves that problem. It's fascinating, it's just, it's just inevitable. But unfortunately, 
it, it also comes with a heavy price with the current system in that they can lose control of the monetary system. And it, even in America, there was a, a congressman from California who his exact, I got it up in front of me. He's trying to make cryptocurrency illegal in the US, which is really laughable. And it makes you understand how little they understand about the technology. But he says an awful lot of our international power stems from the fact that the dollar is the standard of unit of international finance and transaction. And it is the announced purpose of the supporters of cryptocurrencies to take that power away from us. <laughs> so it's like the biggest advertisement for cryptocurrency, you know, not that everybody that believes in it are a bunch of anarchists that want to see the system fail, but we deserve as uh, members of this planet to have an option other than the banking system. I mean, we look at the banking failures and we look at the, you know, how the devaluation of currencies all over the world. It's not fair um, to us to have to rely on that. And now, and even more frightening for the establishment right now, U.S. and China are at having trade wars and China is using cryptocurrency to hedge against that. So it's, it's going to be an interesting game changer and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You'd have to shut down the entire internet, which means all food production stops, all airplanes stop working, everything stops. So it's yeah. impossible to stop. I think. No, it's impossible. It's yeah. uh, <laughs> so many nodes around, millions of people. So you cannot stop. I think it's something that you cannot stop, except that you stop internet. So right, <laughs> right. Be many, many years that this can happen. I think they will put more regulation, but they will allow to the cryptocurrency to move. I, th I see a future where the governments will have their uh, cryptocurrency maybe related. Uh, to their fiat currency yeah. that they will use because they have many advantages on this. Yeah. Bank institutions are always adapting the technology, you know. It was for free because as it said, the decentralized technology, the code of the technology is free, like yeah. Ethereum or Bitcoin or other currencies. So imagine that these big uh, corporations and banks and institutions that generally they are spending a fortune to protect uh, the customers, to protect the, the bank account uh, from uh, hacker attacks and any kinds of uh, uh, trials to steal money to people. Now they ha they adopt they are adopting this technology completely for free. Yep, it's great. And it's this a... was something that Satoshi Nakamoto was not thinking probably. That now, <laughs> unfortunately, it is happening, you know, in the world because it was built to be decentralized, and now the biggest uh, centralized institution are adopting for free. And so this is the period, the bullish period for crypto. Yeah, no, it's absolutely the bu most bullish period. It's sort of like the internet in the 1990s. Uh, most people don't understand yeah. it. But it, unlike the internet, where you have private companies with stocks that go up in value, this, as you said, it's a decentralized network that has a value attached, which is so crazy. Like if you think about the invention of the light bulb, it didn't have a value attached from the day it's of invention. It took time to build a market. Cryptocurrency had a, Bitcoin had a value ad attached to it from the moment of its inception. And what's also fun is no one owns it. It's so confusing for people. You know, they're like, well, who, who owns Bitcoin? Nobody. Well, that, I don't, I don't no, understand. The funny, the, funny, the funny stuff is that, uh, for example, if you go on some uh, American exchange because you want to list a new coin, mm -hmm. they ask the list who are the owners. Right, right. You know? yeah. and, uh, and maybe there are some developers or I can have an idea, but maybe I can have 1% of the coins, of pre-mined coins, and 99% who is the owner? I mean, the world is the owner. Right. I don't know who is the owner yeah. because they will be produced in 20 years. So. Yeah. Uh, so they don't understand really how it really works. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, kind of like how every person and every company has a website now, <clears throat> at least for companies. It's going to be that way. I think every bank's going to have its own crypto. Every company is going to have its own crypto, and it's just going to be the norm. And it's going to be tied to whatever, you know, and then traded against, you know, the other cryptos that had started it all. But anyway, whatever. We could talk about this for hours, but it's always fun to yes. um, talk about things in our own lives on these uh, my podcasts, um, you know, because it's, you know, we're all, you know, busy with our yes. own interesting things. So, well, <clears throat> we've been talking for almost an hour. Um, 
I'd love to, we can talk later about this, but, um, you know, we uh, take trips to Europe kind of often. And, um, yeah, we might come see you sometime this year in Florence, you know, because um, especially if you're interested in maybe organizing something to share this technology of M-Cell with more people, um, yes. I, I, that might be fun. I'd love an excuse to have another lecture and give another, you know, we can record it on video and release it to the world for free and, and have a whole new audience for it. That'd be great. Let's, let's it do it. Be good. We can organize something in Florence. We can have some people, also some doctors or some very interested audience so yeah it would be nice yeah i would be very happy to do this yeah yeah let's talk about it well thank you ricardo i know it's probably getting late there in florence but um this is so much fun thank you so much for uh Oh, doing thanks this. for calling and that was very nice talking to you and I hope that someone will get benefits from this uh, recording around because it's important that people uh, they know that something is existing and if we can support or have someone just sharing our experience is something great that's why I, I do this that's why I you know do make these movies and uh, that's why I wanted to reach out to you so hopefully somebody else will hear this I'm curious what point of the time of you getting the therapy, did you find out about me? I'm just curious how that happened. It happened about uh, six months ago. Oh, okay. All right. Not before, six months ago, because I wanted to see if there was something new, and I discovered the, I discovered the video, you know, mm -hmm. and I saw the, 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 the video, and I said, wow, it's very well made. I, 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 I didn't know it was talking about uh, I'm cell as well because I was uh, uh, reading about fetus steam cell, the good cells. So in the title, you didn't mention I'm cell. Right. I, I saw YouTube. I, I think I saw YouTube. Yes. And uh, after that, it was uh, it was long. So and then I, I said, oh, it's, they mentioned I'm cell, and I saw that you were going to the clinic. Uh, and uh, I was very happy, and I saw you doing the test, and I was remembering <laughs> when I was there. So yeah. I said, wow, it's the same, you know, Miss Alina that is doing the aesthetic treatment. <laughs> that's right, because, yeah, that's so cool. So, yeah, so you, you're you like, that's my doctor, too. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes, and it was funny for me, because I said, wow, he's doing exactly what I did already, and uh, it was nice. And uh, and so from, from there, I, it was six months ago, and uh, I was already planning to to go to Kiev as well. So I said to my wife, I need to write to, to Eric. If I don't know if he will reply to me, because uh, <laughs> I would like to to share the experience because these people deserve this. Yeah, honestly, I'm happy to reply to anyone. I don't get that many emails. I mean, you don't get that many people because I think the subject matter, it's confusing, the controversy. Yeah. So um, my previous movies, like my first one, I just, my email box was just bombarded. Um, but this one, that's why I'm always happy. I mean, I'm luckily, you know, I'm not getting overwhelmed with people yet. So anybody that wants to contact me, I'm happy to get in touch with them. So, yeah. No, probably... And maybe it requires a little bit more time. You know, the fact is that uh, if there are no some other opinion leaders, people are scared. I think that many people watch or or they would like, then they ask their doctor and the doctor say, well, I don't know, it's experimental, be careful. Yeah. So people are weak. Yeah. Uh, week if we don't do face-to-face uh, -face with people or uh, I, I can talk to friends and family and sometimes uh, it's hard for them not for my mom or my brother maybe but for other people cannot be easy as well so I guess if someone don't don't know you uh, it's uh, something spectacular to hear but there is a hope that it works so I don't understand why people because the health is so important for people sometimes they have terrible illness why then they don't give a try I can't understand I know I know it's this sort of the story of my life there's some personalities and what makes it worse too sometimes is when someone really wants to do a therapy <clears throat> then the wife or the husband or the parents or somebody just gets really angry and doesn't want them to do it and you have that to struggle with it's not easy it's not easy um, so yeah. yes, I know that you made a couple <clears throat> the other film I just saw the titles so the Wojcicki and the light reel uh, anti-cancer treatment. I just saw the title, so I know that uh, also the arguments are very 
particular, I mean, because controversial. Yeah, to say the least. <clears throat> My first one, Brzezinski, is a guy who um, is a scientist that, uh, it's a really long story, but he realized there's a, a peptide relationship to cancer with the amino acids, and he patented that and went through clinical testing. And But because it's such a powerful competitor to chemotherapy, um, the more and he was... Uh, the only owner of the patents, not the, you know, the industry didn't own it. He would have the yes. ability to compete with them. They just pulled out all the guns, the big guns to try to destroy him, but they failed, but he still hasn't had it approved, but he can still treat people. <clears throat> the Laetrile one is, is not about promoting or suggesting anyone take it. It's just a whistleblower story that happened at Sloan Kettering in New York where all these people were going to Mexico to get this in the 1970s. And it sounds ridiculous. It's, it's harvest, you know, taken from apricot pits. It sounds like a scam, yeah. <clears throat> but they tested it for five years because they were asked to under the idea that let's just prove to the world that this is a big scam. And to everyone's surprise, it stopped the spread of cancer 80% of the time when injected into the bloodstream, um, not when eaten or taken orally, but injected in mice. Injected. And of course yeah. they were forced to cover this up because you couldn't patent that it, it was just a, a byproduct of the apricot canning industry of california basically it's like what we throw away and you it very people could make this stuff in their garage so anyway and then of course that's the story that got me into all of this uh, when i found out about that that was supposed to be my first movie but it ended up being my third or fourth movie but uh anyway and then off i go to stem cells a whole new direction so. yes yes <laughs> yeah. yes yes but uh, uh how if uh, I can ask how how are you getting money from this? You have some sponsors. You uh, you sell some CD, DVD. Uh. So. I started out as an artist and then I moved to New York City to try to be an artist and then I started working on Madison Avenue in advertising. I made good money, but I got I got sucked into it and I started getting really unhappy. I just said I can't do this for the rest of my life. I've always had big interest in TV and film as well and of course documentaries. So my first movie Brzezinski, I did that by charging an outrageous amount of credit card debt and exhausting my personal savings and calling in sick to work and you know traveling on the weekends and that movie was actually very successful it was released originally in 2010 and where my income came a good income came from dvds because people actually bought dvds back then yeah, that so, time, yeah. yeah so when you buy you know say ten thousand dvds uh more credit card debt of course that cost only a dollar each and then you sell them for 15 or 20 dollars each that can be very profitable so that's what i did to pay for my second and third movie and by the time I was kind of almost done by with my Laetrile whistleblower movie, Seconds Opinion. I was running out of money. and But I also, at the same time, started getting random donations from people that just liked what I was doing. And then, so people would say, if you have a 501c3 nonprofit, I could give you more money to support what you're doing. So by the time I was working on the Laetrile whistleblower movie, I started figuring out how to navigate the donation system. So people that, and honestly, a lot of these people were people that were cured by Brzezinski of, say, brain cancer or other types of cancer oh, wow. that were very, very wealthy. So that's where it began. And then it just sort of kind of like a dominoes. People said, they like, oh, you heard about this guy, Eric. He's doing these movies. You know, you can write it off as a tax write-off. So I, I partnered with a or an organization in California that allows, that it's legal, so it's for independent filmmakers. And it's, I have to show all of my receipts for all my production and, you know, to prove that that's where the money's yeah. going. So to answer your question, yeah. So by the time I did The God Cells, I had a, this whole system just perfect. So and even to this day, all my trips to Ukraine are funded by the same group. I say, I'm going to go again. I'm going to do some more filming because I'm working on a sequel. It's going to take a long time. Not only am I following new people, because every time I go, there's more Americans that go. And I just, if they agree, I film them and I follow up with them. But they MSL also cured male infertility. And I'm trying really hard to find Americans <clears throat> or English speaking men that have been deemed infertile to um, do that, um, to, you know, to cover that. So, and also with M cells new clinic and now realizing they're literally the only place on earth that's doing this, which I didn't realize when making the first movie, there are other places that claim to be doing it, but not the, it's not, uh, not the same as M cell because they're only using one cell cell type or two cell types while M cells using dozen or more cell types. And 
and then they're also using replicated cells while M cell is not. Anyway, so to answer your question, yes, it's outside funding. So I don't make any money off of these anymore because no one buys DVDs. And there's no money in the distribution of like say Amazon um, because you get maybe three to five pennies per viewing. And now, and which, you know, I might be lucky to bring in $2,000 a year on that kind of, you know. So, um, and now of course, with it being censored, it's just no way. So it's a big charitable, you know, donation on my part, but it's good because I get, you know, I'm able to pay my rent and feed myself and I'm able to pay for the, the, uh, trips, but it's also fun because I get to meet people like you. I've met so many wonderful new people and new friends in this journey. So while it is not the most secure way to make a living, it's still fun and I'm able to get by and I don't, you know, have any kids yet. And I don't know. It's just fun. I, I I'm not going to stop yes, doing it anytime soon. It's a great, I yeah. think it's a great adventure. Yeah. This, this is definitely a great adventure. So yeah. it's very good what you're doing. Very interesting and very useful for some, some people at least. I mean, yeah. even if you have uh, 10 people per year that are visiting themselves that, and uh, fix the problem or reduce their problem, it's something like a miracle. So it works. Yeah. I mean, it's good. Yeah. And... Exactly. And, but what's also why I'm continuing to my work with M cell versus my other films where I kind of did it. Well, Brzezinski, I spent, I did a few movies uh, because it just, the, the story keeps going. The whistleblower story was a piece of history that just, you know, that just is what it is. But since M cell has this new clinic, they also might be applying for phase one FDA testing in the United States for people waiting in line for a heart transplant that might happen. Um, and the new clinic is going to have an FDA sort of, um, but when, when, will be ready the new clinic well they'd like to have it ready by the end of this year is ideal but you know like anything that's you're building a brand new building and a brand new everything brand new lab not everything goes on schedule you know so they wanted to have it open by now to be honest when i was there last i toured the clinic um they have uh, some of the new treatment rooms all you know like they look beautiful they're like little hotel rooms um and uh, they have a beautiful view of this beautiful courtyard and it's kind of out in the country by all by itself kind of it's just it's gorgeous and they built the building from the ground up but they're also the lab is being um they're they're hiring consultants that are sort of authorized by the fda or approved by the fda to be consultants to build a lab up to fda standards so in order to apply for a clinical trial you have to have your laboratory up to standards um and then you can do that so it's a very long bureaucratic process to get to the point yeah but to answer your question if they are uh, are able to get it open by the end of this year. They're hoping to do epidural uh, neuronal cells into the uh, spinal fluid for people with certain neurological conditions like, say, Parkinson's or mu- muscular dystrophy, a uh, whole host of things, honestly. Um, they also are working on um, pa- uh, insulin-producing pancreas uh, uh, cells for people that with type one diabetes. So, um, yeah, so that's really amazing. They've proven this in the lab, but they need to graduate to doing clinical testing of this using laparoscopic uh, surgeries for that. There's a lot of things. Um, they're going to do injections right into the eyes from people with macular degeneration. That's something that they're hoping to do and just continuing to expand. Um, you know, they're, they're not satisfied like anything scientific there's always room to grow. And when you have more capital, since they're doing well enough and they're reinvesting everything that they make, they have no bank loans. Everything that they're doing is by you know using their, their profits, if you their would, money. yeah, to continue to grow. Profits. Yeah, so that side of them is really exciting. I just, I, I just can't stop studying or, or following these people. Not to mention how long it took to gain their trust. That was not easy um, to, you know, go through that process. I'm the only member, I think, of the American, quote, media that has gotten this close to them, even though I don't work for anyone but myself. Um, Anyway, as long as they'll let me uh, in on what they're doing, I'm going to hang around, you know, and and, and, and help share with the world what they're doing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's very, very interesting. I appreciate what you're doing. Very, very very interesting, very good, very useful for the community as well. So yeah. it's great. It's, I mean, yeah, very good. it's very great. It's a, yeah, it's much better than my days of Madison Avenue selling people. You know, I worked, I did pharmaceutical ads. I did ads for Lockheed Martin, which makes nuclear weapons. I did ads for cigarettes for Philip Morris. I did ads for the banking system. I, I mean, you know, I mean, I did some fun stuff too, but uh, it's just, yeah. I mean, I sort of take what I learned as an artist and the sort of the creative process and, and apply that for good. And since I used to be an animator as well, 
well since I used to do editing. I don't have to hire an editor. I don't have to hire a motion graphics person. I got good at um, you know learning how to I guess shooting commercials. I learned how to shoot you know, video, and I just apply all of those talents now to where I can do these films on a low budget because I can handle most of it on my own. And I hire assistants when I need to, except for the music. I have to hire people, a professional musician, to score my movies. You know, I can't do everything. You know, <laughs> so yeah, but yeah. Not- I know what uh, what you're doing, and I heard that y- your wife is helping you as well in the production. Yep, she <laughs> she sort of was sort of. I mean, it wasn't planned that way, but uh, it's like I don't, you know, why? Who better than my wife uh, to be my production partner, and uh, you yeah. know, the second cameraman. So even though she has no like formal experience with it, you know, you, just, you do it enough, you learn how to do it, and um, so yeah, she helps with a lot of the organization because like, when are we flying here? Uh, where are we staying? You know, she helps with that. She's like my producer, but she's, she's also a private chef. So she's uh, sort of holistically trained in New York. So she's actually, uh, she doesn't, she, she's like a freelancer kind of like I was where she has clients around Los Angeles that have special dietary needs. She'll either come into the home and cook for them or she'll deliver the food to those families. Like one of her clients has Crohn's disease. Another client is strictly gluten free and you know, things like that. So she's also very, in touch and in tune with the health world and so she helps me with the, with the research side of all of this and um and honestly too when i go to m cell or even the previous movies here i am this in this director with the cameras you know and these people this is very personal for people this is their lives and especially people dying of cancer with my not the m cell story but previous stories or people with very bad diseases or say a child with autism somehow my wife uh, she's just a sweet lady and she disarms everybody and it's just a good chemistry um but yeah so basically it's me and my it's wife good yeah. it, yes it's important to have uh a good attitude with people. I mean, I agree with you. It's someone that maybe they are a, li- a little bit ashamed uh, or they don't like to talk about these. Uh, and so it's good because she, probably she has some good feelings. Yeah. Every, every time I go and my wife's not with me, they, they're they always disappointed. They, it's like they like her better than me. It's funny. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. Well, this has been wonderful. Let's stay in touch. Um, we might, uh, we have, my wife has some time off in July and we were talking yeah. about planning a trip. I'll probably also be doing something related to the, you know, my documentary work while I'm in Europe anyway, but we always try to, if possible, uh, and we love your, uh, Italy. I mean, I, we went to Rome for our wedding anniversary last year and we said, we've got to go back. And because of some of my roots are in Italy, even though I've never really been, um, you know, and I love Italian food and, you know, all of that that comes with it. Um, and I'd love to go. So maybe we'll end up seeing yes, each other. We, as mentioned, we are living very close to Florence in Tuscany. So it's a wonderful place to come. If you come, we can you can spend Sunday, Sundays with us. We can go around a little bit. And if you want, I can try to organize a, a first small meeting to talk about it himself and, and just just to give a, a beginning, maybe also in our country, about this and attract more people and start from here as well. Why not? Why not? Yeah, it's worth a try. Very good. Yeah. I can teach you some Italian as well. Okay, <laughs> okay great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Except- That'd be- Pasta or pizza that probably you know already. Oh, I know um, very many curse words from being a child. Um, my father doesn't speak great Italian anymore, but whenever he would say work on something in construction, like with a hammer, and he hits his finger, I've heard many curse words. Yeah. Well, so, Eric, thank you for your time, and thanks for the podcast, and uh, I know you are going to Kiev, so say hello to all the staff when you will be there, and if you like, uh, we write you sometimes. And all right. Thank you, Benny. What's that? Molto bene, it means ah. uh, very good. Ah, yeah, yes. <laughs> mucho bene. Is that right? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, have a great day and uh, hello to you, to your family, and it was nice to meet you. Thank you, you too, Ricardo. Have a nice night. Thank you. Ciao, Eric. Grazie. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. For the upcoming sequel to The God Cells, I am actively looking for infertile males who have failed all fertility treatments. M-Cell's fetal stem cell technology has about a 30% cure rate for male infertility. If you or someone you know is interested, email me at eric at ericmarola.com. I'd like to include you in my sequel. 
As I mentioned in today's episode, it's not a bother for me to answer questions about my documentary or my experience with this therapy. Feel free to email me, eric at e-r-i-c-m-e-r-o-l-a dot com. See you next time in episode six of the God Cells podcast.